Um, you probably have seen the debugger before, hopefully by now, in the different IDEs that we've used up to this point. Pretty much every IDE out there has one. It's The debugger is kind of what makes an IDE an IDE. Um, if you don't have an IDE, you're not if you don't have a debugger, you don't really have an IDE, you just have a text editor. Um, and it's it's really helpful for finding and, and fixing problems as they come up. And the main reason that exists is for diagnosis. Okay, So you find out that, hey, this behavior is happening, this unexpected behavior is happening. Usually it starts with you finding out that your application is crashing, um, but not always. Usually it starts with you finding out that it's crashing or maybe that it's just misbehaving. So we'll go through, you know, hey, here's this bugger tool. What can we do in that case? So kind of the overview for today, talk about bugs a little bit. And, and as they say, every application has bugs. Um, there is not really such a thing as a bug-free application. There are sometimes bugs in Android or Windows, and sometimes there's bugs in the operating system itself, sometimes there's bugs in the libraries that you're using. Or in the case of, you know, one of the things I was working over the last summer working with um, MongoDB, well, they made a change, but they didn't document that they made a change, right? So their documentation says one thing, the actual interface is something else, right? Um, so that happens. We'll talk about logging again, just review on that. And we'll talk about the debugger, um, talk about working with breakpoints, how do you look at view variables. You can also, ch in, in here, you can also actually change them at runtime, um, which can sometimes be helpful for, for testing. And then talking about, hey, we want to step through the code. We want to do it line by line. What are some of the buttons and functionalities that are there? Okay, so let's start off with this. All code has bugs. It's true. Um, no matter how hard we work on making our code clean, there's always going to be something. In, in any reasonably sized program, there's going to be something you miss. Um, so we plan for that, right? We know that we're going to miss something. So let's go ahead and plan for that eventuality and put um, tools and, and tools and methods for debugging that, for fixing those issues or, or finding out that those issues occur when they happen rather than them going on unnoticed to us. Okay. So bugs can be quite a few different things. They can be either we can have unexpected incorrect results. You can say, hey, well, I did this and this and this. I expected this answer to come out at the end, right? So what might that be? Let's say you're calculating tax. Well, the tax is calculated wrong, right? You're calculating interest that number comes out wrong. So your calculations come, come out wrong, you can get the unexpected output. That's one thing. Um, you can also have crashes, right? You'll, you do this, da, 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 oh, crash, and back on home screen. That's really the big one um, that comes up the most, and those are for sure, you don't want to ship your app with any of those bugs in there, right? You don't want to ship your app where, oh, they do this, it crashes, it takes them back to the home screen. That for sure, hey, there's going to always be some issues, but we want to ship our application where it doesn't crash for sure. That's that's one thing that we usually at least can get to the point where we can guarantee that if we're writing this code. Um, you might get exceptions. Exceptions can be a problem, but if we at least if we catch those exceptions, then they don't become crashes, right? If we don't catch the exception, now it's a crash, right? So we got to know what is going to cause those exceptions and to go ahead and preemptively deal with them, even if we don't necessarily see them ourselves. Okay? Uh, freezes can happen on Android as well, um, especially given that, you know, hey, sometimes our things are a little bit intensive on the hardware. Sometimes we have very low end hardware. So even things like switching screens um, can sometimes get us into a case where we freeze or because there's so much work that happens when you turn it portrait to landscape, right? We're destroying the whole thing, tearing it down and building it back up. I've seen applications freeze in that case as well. Just as simple as that. Sometimes you can get an application to freeze just by turning it on its side. Okay. So those are things to deal with. Memory leaks are actually a really big deal when it comes to 
Android, you don't have that much memory to work with in the big, at, in the first place, right? You don't have the eight or sixteen gigs installed on the usual smartphone, so you got to make use the best use you can with what you have a lot of, right? So you might only have several megs that you can work with on an actual phone. Um, it may be that there's a gig of memory, but what you're actually your application is allowed to use might be four or sixteen megs. Right? So we want to make sure that we're not wasting memory. Right? Now wasting memory is a little bit beyond what we're going to talk about today because then you usually end up finding yourself getting into the profiler, um, which is not something we're going to cover today because it's a little bit more advanced. Um, but then just know that that does exist. Okay. Um, causes, there can be a lot of different causes for bugs and for errors. Um, sometimes they're caused by our human mistakes, the way we design the application or the way we implement it, right? It can actually be both of those things, right? It can be how we write the code. It can be how we write the requirements, right? Does that make sense? The bug can be what we've asked you to build, right? Or how we've decided to fix this problem is, is entirely flawed, okay? Um, it can also be on the side of the libraries, right? So if we're using some third-party library to do X, Y, Z, whether it work with JSON data, whether it be sending things to Facebook, whether it be working with YouTube, all of these kind of things, there can be bugs in those libraries as well, right? So those we have to deal with sometimes as well. There we work around, there we usually, well, we can't change their code, we can't fix their code, so let's just make sure we can find out what's causing it. Let's just make not that sure that doesn't happen, right? But sometimes we can work around those things by making sure they don't happen in the first place. Um, and then sometimes there are hardware differences. Um, not all Android devices are created the same. In fact, um, when I was working in the industry, we were working a lot with Samsung Tab 3s. Um, on the surface, they all say Samsung Tab 3. Um, in fact, there's a lot of different model numbers, somewhere 5 to 10 different model numbers for a Samsung Tab 3. They're different. <laughs> At the hardware and software level, there are differences. Um, so even though they may look like the same device on the outside, um, because they were built and shipped at different times. Samsung put different pieces of hardware, changed the hardware over time, as well as changing the firmware, as well as changing the software that's running there. Um, so like for instance, some things are in this folder and they're on here, right? They're on one folder in one version of the device, they're in another folder in another version of the device. Some commands are there, some commands are not, yada, yada. Um, so you kind of have to be aware and ready for those things and do your best to kind of, A, the more you're, the farther you are away from the hardware, the less issues you're going to have, um, but also accounting for all of those different things that can be a problem. Obvious, obviously, the most, the, the most obvious ones are screen density and screen size, right? Those are the ones that we first and foremost we know about, right? We know that there's there's small devices. We know there's big device devices with small screens. We know there's devices with big screens. We know that some of them are high resolution displays. Some of them are low resolution displays, right? So we can start there, and then dealing with languages as well. So those are the kind of things we have to deal with from the hardware side, primarily. But it can go a lot deeper than that. So. The idea of debugging is to go find those errors, go find those bugs, and fix them, right? But first we have to diagnose them. We need to diagnose them to the point where we really understand what is causing them. Um, I've seen a lot of harm with people trying to fix bugs without understanding the underlying cause, right? Um, in one case, our company, I think we, we had one developer go off and spend one to three months working on a project only to find out at the end of that that they hadn't fixed several of the underlying issues. In fact, because they were rebuilding the system, they'd undone a lot of fixes that we'd done previously, if that makes sense. Not understanding what the problems were or what the system was trying to solve. So 
one big, big, big thing to do when you're debugging, always get to the point where you perfectly understand what's going on, right? You don't want to take a shot in the dark and go, hey, I fixed the thing, right? And then your user comes back and says, no, you didn't, right? <laughs> or what happened is because you made that fix, now we've got three bugs instead of one, um, where you made the problem worse because, okay, now the, the, the code that you introduced has its own issues um, in addition to the issue that's there. Okay. So one other tool which we'll talk about tomorrow, um, we can use unit tests in here as well, um, which will help us identify bugs specifically in things that we know we're working at some point in time. Like here's what the expected behavior is, let's test for it and keep that long term so that if I make changes, um, I can quickly test and see that there's no errors in those kind of critical pathways of our of our application. Um, but unit tests only go so far. The whole idea with unit tests is they're testing a very small part. So we always have to add to that um, tests that are actually testing the UI. Um, and, and sometimes we can do that in, on, in an automated way. Um, there are some tools for that for doing automated testing through the UI, um, but you usually at some point need to put it into actual user hands as well. Okay. So Android Studio has a lot of tools that are built in. Um, they'll help us identify what the problems are. Um, we can track down to usually what line number it is, especially if we have a crash. If we look at a crash, we can see, oh, well, it's line number three or four or 28. Um, usually we can do that, and then we can net, once we see that, then we can fix it. Okay, so working with logging in Android Studio. We've gone over some of this already, so I'm going to kind of skim through this pretty quickly. Um, first thing we need to do, remember, if we want to use logging, we need to import Android Util Log. Second thing is we need to declare this tag. Again, we want to declare this tag so that we're not using it as a relay. Uh, convention is to use this, the term, let's just call it tag. And this is usually the first constant in your, in your class. We say public or private static file. Private static file is probably better. Um, and tag. So that's all we call it. And we call it down. If we say log, log level, the tag, and the message. Okay. Now that could be a very useful general tool for solving a lot of problems. And especially when you especially when you go live, um, after you've gone live, um, this can still be a helpful tool um, if you're looking at errors this way, because once you have Android Studio set up once you have ADV set up I can't actually just plug a, a, a USB cord into my device and I can still see those error messages even though I can't use my debugging tools um, so there's a lot of ways that this can still be useful even later down the pipeline Does that makes sense um, the debugger is really great but I have to have physical access to the device to do that um, and I have to have physical access to the device at the time that happens. Okay. So there are ways that you can say, okay, well, send me a log file or send me this. Um, so those can be kind of debugged offline if you have the logs. So we looked at the log pane, log cat pane. You can see that that's at the bottom, and we have the log cat tab. And just a refresher on kind of the structure of that. So we've got here's the one that's logging, log D, so it's logging at a debug level. The tag is main activity, the text is hello world. Okay. So that first part, what's this first part? What does that represent? When it was logged, right? So that was in when the log message was written. 
Any guesses as to what this is? 4304. That's actually not part of this part. Not four. The line. It's not the line number. Well, here's a hint. If I stop the program and rerun it, this will be a different number. Okay, this is what we call the process ID. Okay, so as you're running the application for one run of the application, it should all be the same number. But if you stop the application and restart it, you should see a new number. That's, that's the process ID. It's actually a really low, this actually comes from Linux is where we get that process ID. So that's a really low level. Next, what can I see here? Tom, example, Android, hello world. What is that? The package. The package, right? So we've got the timestamp, the process ID, the package. We've got a D here, right, for the level. I've got the tag, and then I've got the message, right? So the part that we care about most is usually that part on. Um, usually we can ignore everything else that's over on the left because as long as you're filtered down to just your application, this is really what we care about most of the time. Now, if I'm getting a log from somebody else, right? So I've got this log file from somebody else, that's where I might want to look at the attendance. I might want to look at when it happened, when the log was recorded, and what application recorded it, if I'm looking at kind of a saved log. Does that make sense? So that's part of why those are in there. But most of the time we just scroll to the end and look at the end of the line. Okay. Remember that you can filter the messages that appear um, on three different times. You can filter it by the device, by the application, and by the level. Um, I generally would recommend setting this to warning or higher, setting it to warning if you're looking for errors. Um, if you don't find anything there, then you will need to debug. But the, remember, the, the higher you have it in here, or the lower level, um, the more messages you're going to see, right? So that means more noise, right? And usually we want to filter down to the point where we're only seeing the messages that are relevant. Uh, the other thing that you can do, you'll notice there's a search box, I don't think it shows up here, right to the right of that drop down, where you can type in the test. And that can be really helpful to make sure you're only getting things for your application instead of the entire operating system. Okay, so general rule for the different levels, okay? Um, verbose is kind of anything you want to write. That's the very lowest level things. Um, in general, I have, there's very little that's actually useful on the verbose level. Does that make sense? Usually it's so fine grained that it's not really helpful. Um, debug is that next level where we're going to put in log statements, but we're only putting those in kind of temporarily. We're putting those in, so if you're saying, I want to know when on stop, on start, when those lifecycle methods are called, I want to put that at the debug level because I would only be concerned about that as I'm actively debugging. Does that make sense? It doesn't really tell me much about the state of the application. Info is important kind of events that happen. Um, so again, like the user logging in, connecting to a database, connecting to a service, all of those things you may want to put in there, um, but recognize none of this data, one important thing to remember, all this data that you're writing out is not encrypted, okay? So anybody can read it. Um, don't write any passwords or connection strings or URLs out to there um, because somebody who's interested in getting into your device or getting into um, your service will they can get that. It's completely in. There is no security about that. I don't even have to unlock your phone to get into login. Okay. Let me say that again. I do not have to log in. I do not have to have your password to get all your log cat messages. Um, 
So don't put anything in there that might be using group address. Does that make sense? Um, so info, again, if something happens, it's not a problem. If something did happen. Warning is something, something went wrong, right? But it didn't crash, right? So if we caught an exception, warning might be a good thing to spit out there. Okay. If we didn't catch an exception, you'll see this anytime you didn't catch an exception, especially when your application crashed, there's a really good channel to check. Um, because there more than likely will be something there that immediately tells you what's wrong. The error is typically reserved for only things that cause a crash. Okay, so if your application is is writing the E, writing the error channel when it's not crashing, that's a problem. So. How do we debug in Android Studio? Okay, so we've seen how we do the we use the logging tools. Um, we can also attach a debugger, right? So logging statements are great. I can kind of put them in there and, and have them have them set for important events. Um, but sometimes I need to find out what's going wrong, but I don't want to change the code, right? I don't want to put logging statements everywhere. Um, so uh, debugging becomes really helpful in those cases. Um, we can set breakpoints. Um, we can get the the we can get it to stop at those breakpoints, and we can also see what the variables are at any given time in there. We can change values, and we can step through that that line by line. Um, we can also in there at any point in time we can technically pause the application, even if we're not at a breakpoint. Although usually that's not all that helpful, at least in my experience. Okay, so where is the debugger in Android? So I'm going to open up Android Studio. Um, and actually, let me go to Hello Toast because we know how that one works. So I've got the application running on the, the emulator, right? Um, but one thing, one thing here, okay, so let's look at the bottom. Do you see a debug tab? No debug tab there, right? I've got run, I don't have a debug tab. So to actually get the debug tab, um, I typically need to start it with the debugger attached. So up on the top, See, there's this little bug icon. Looks like a bug, green bug. So that's start the application with the debugger attached, right? Your normal green arrow does not start with the debugger attached. So if I want the debugger, I need to click that button. Or if the application's already running and you just want to jump into it at the point where it is instead of restarting it, you can click this attach debugger button, right? So if I click there, We'll start running into the debugger. Okay, I'm in there. And you can see now I've got this debug tab down at the bottom. Um, there's two tabs within the debug tab. There's a console tab, which kind of shows you what is going back and forth between your computer and the device usually not honestly all that helpful so i'm just going to go over to the debugger tab which is where we're going to spend most of our time today so under the debugger tab that's where i'm at if i do want to it let's say i'm going to stop the application run it again so i'm in this state where the application's running you know maybe Maybe something's up. I want to go ahead and debug it at this point instead of restarting it. Okay. Maybe you're testing your shopping list and you don't want to have to re-add everything to there. Okay. So I can hit attach debugger. It'll ask me which application and which device do I want to connect to. So I've only got the emulator running. That's the only one that's giving me. But if I also had my physical device connected, my tablet, then it would show up here as well. So I'm going to go ahead and hit OK. 
so I'm attached. So you can get to it either way. You can start it with debugging, or you can attach to an existing application. Does that make sense? So that's step one, right? Um, just by doing that, I haven't really done anything useful yet, right? I've got it attached, it's, it's, it's running with that debugger, but so far I can't really do anything useful yet. So the first step, once you, the next step once you've got it attached is to go put a breakpoint in. So I can put one over here on the sidebar, or the gutter as they would say, between the line numbers and the actual code. And you can see it's showed up as a red circle, right? So I can put in a, a breakpoint in any line I'm interested in. You'll notice that this one's kind of crossed off because there's actually no line of code there. You know, it's just a comment. So, also in there, you'll notice there's a little checkbox, little checkbox on there on each of those breakpoints. That means I'm currently in the debugger. Okay. If I run it without the debugger, notice that those checkboxes are not there. The checkboxes are not there. So that's what that's telling me. It's telling me that, that I am actually in the debugger, so they will actually be hit. Because otherwise they're just ignored. Okay. So I put a breakpoint here on the first line of show toast. Right? So that breakpoint is says before you actually run this line of code, stop and tell me. Okay? Stop and wait for me. Does that make sense? thing you remember there, it's always your breakpoint is before it runs that line of code. It's not after it runs that line of code, it's before. Okay, so if I click the toast button now, because that's where I've set the breakpoint, you can see how the line gets highlighted, right? So it's stopping and it's waiting for me, right? The actual Android device is, is paused. Um, so it's waiting here, and I can see some of the variables if I look down on the bottom section, right? So first of all, in this variable section, I've got this, right, which refers to the activity object in this case, right? It refers to the class that I'm in, right? So I'm in main activity, so it refers to the object main activity. I've also got view. What is view? Where's that one coming from? We're in the code. Where's that view coming from? Uh, it's, a parameter. it's a parameter, right. So it's a parameter or, or a local variable, right? So what we see in here in the variables tab will always be two things. You'll see this, which refers to the object that you're, you're working with, and then the rest of it will be your local variables, okay? Any local variables I have. Now notice that toast doesn't show up yet, right? Because toast doesn't really exist. I haven't run that line yet. Okay. Now, anything that's in here, if it's just a primitive value, I'll just see it. Um, but if it's an object or an array, I'll have to actually expand to look at what's in there. Um, so you'll notice that both of these things are objects. So they've got a little arrow to the left of them. Okay. So if I expand view, we can see a few things in here. Um, probably the most interesting one for me to look at would be the text. So if I look at the text of the, the view, well, I can see that the text of that is toast. Oh, okay, well, that's because it's the toast button. Does that make sense? Um, so you may want to go through and, and, and look at a lot of properties like that. But you'll notice, right, there's a lot of properties, even just on that simple view, right? I don't necessarily want to scroll through all of these properties anytime I want to go into the debugger. Okay. If I look at mcount, right, remember that's this, I can look at my member variables so I can see, okay, well the count right now is, is zero. Um, and m show count, yep, I do have a control there because it's not null. Right. Okay. So let me let me run, let me get this resumed again. Um, there's a little button here on the left. If you're ever at a breakpoint, you can hit that to go to to resume where you're at. So I'm going to hit resume because what I want to do is increment the counter, and I'll come back in here. So I'm going to go count, push that up to three, go back into toast, 
and we can see now I now I have that new value, right? Okay. Now let's say that I want to see some some useful values. I don't want to have to dig into these objects every time that I want to look at them. So if we look here on the bottom, you see this view, you see this button that looks like a pair of glasses. So that opens the watch tab. Okay. In the watch tab, I can type in anything I'm curious on keeping an eye on. And that way, every time I get into the debugger, it will show me the value of that. Right. So for this particular application, what might be good things I want to keep an eye on? Where's my application state stored? Okay. I might want to view the count. Okay. Let's type in count here. I'm going to hit count and hit enter. Can't find local variable count. All right. Let me make sure I use the actual name of the, the instance variable. So I'm going to remove that one. Add it again. So m count. Okay. So anytime I look in here, it'll just go ahead and bring up the count. Right. I may also be interested in seeing the text on that control. So if I say m show count dot get text, because I can actually call methods and such through here. It actually gives me it as expressions. So I can actually watch, keep an eye on both of those things. I can see what the value of that variable is. I can see what the, var the value of the text is by calling uh, get text. Um, I can also access the variable directly. So we saw previously that it was m text, right? So I can go m show count dot m text. Oh. That is not what I want. So in, inside of the debugger, inside watches and such, notice that I can actually see the value of private variables, right? It doesn't matter whether they're public or private or protected. Whatever access modifier they are, I can still see them. So one thing I quickly should ask here, does that mean that, what does that mean for security? The fact that I can see the variable right there. If you're not aware already, this should at least tell you that the access modifiers are not a security message, right? They're never meant as a security message. Just by marking something private doesn't prevent an attacker from getting that value. Mm -hmm. the, the only reason that we the reason that we have access modifiers in most of our languages, right? All of C family languages have them, you know, private, private, protected, is we're actually protecting ourselves. Right? We're protecting we're protecting our, our future selves or our coworkers from accidentally reading or modifying the variable that they showed us. Does that make sense? The, the access modifiers are really for uh, yourself and other developers that are working with your codes. Does that make sense? That's one of those things that sometimes you can get a little more confused about and it's like, well, if I make it private, then nobody can get in and change it. Yeah. Once it runs, it, everything's public. So there's there I can get that. So I can say I'm show sure get text. Right. Let's say maybe I want to write a more complicated expression in here. We want to use some some comparisons. So let's say while the m let's say m count, I want to say is it less than is it less than ten. Right? So I can write things like that in there as well. I can write full-on expressions. So I can say m count is less than 10 and give me true or false value. So any expression I can write in Java 
I can write here. Does that make sense? Now, one thing that you probably don't want to do is call manipulators down here. So if I say set text, okay, that's valid Java code, right? I'm going to run that. So what did it say? Can't find, oh, show count. So what's happening? What's happening there? So one thing to note there, I can call accessors, um, but I can't call setters through that route. Okay. Um, if I want to kind of, if I do want to try a setter like that, there's a different way to work with it. And bring this over here so they're kind of on the same screen at the same time. And there's this little button up top. You see evaluate expression. Here's where I can do things like that, if I remember right. So set text. And we're going to set it to I don't know, Oh, there it goes. It was still paused. That's why it didn't apply. It'll run it, and then I can kind of see what the output is. Now, note I can't run it as long as it's not paused, right? So is that where I was? What I was told to do? That, that line will run. Whatever line, right? So right now it was on this line. Mm -hmm. So it's basically running it in that the state that it's in. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that that can be helpful. Um, sometimes depending on what you're doing. Now let me go back here. Let's do a toast. Um, again, you see I've kind of put those variables in. I put all those watches in. If I go back and click the, the little eyeglass button, which is now moved over here, you'll see it will combine those things together. Um, so that can be very helpful to say, here are the common things I want to watch, um, and let's put those into my, my list. Does that make sense? So that way I don't have to dig deep into these objects to kind of see what the state of the things are. I can just say, here's the thing I'm really interested in. Let's watch what those states are. Does that make sense? Um, also on the left, what you'll see, this is what we call the stack frames, okay? And that's showing you the sequence of method calls that led to the particular method that you're in, right? So right now we're in the show toast method, which you can see is that top method on the list, right? So it's from most, most recent at the top down to the oldest. Um, now, if I look at what else is in here, it may be a little bit hard because it's kind of faded. You'll see invoke, on click, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, all of that stuff beneath me right now is all the Android operating system. 
right? So if I'm curious about how the Android operating system got me here, I may want to dig through that, right? Sometimes that can be helpful. More than likely, however, the only part that you really care about is the top bits that are your code. That makes sense? Usually the, the only methods that you really care about here in the stack frame are the ones that are your code and not usually the, the operating system or the, um, the JDK. Um, there's also a drop down here to change threads. Um, so that can be interesting as we get into unit three and we're doing more than one thing at a time. Um, however, what you can see, it automatically jumped into the thread that was running our, our method. Um, but if I wanted to look at what else is also going on right now, I could go through there. Okay, so there's there's other things happening in parallel is kind of what you know, I want you to see there. But we're going to really just stay on the main thread. That's all we really care about for now. Okay. So we looked at setting breakpoints. Um, you can also, as you have breakpoints in there, Um, you can also right click on the breakpoint. It'll bring up a little menu like this. And what that lets you do is then say, hey, I only want to stop at a certain point, right? So let's say I actually move this breakpoint. I'm going to move it into here, line 40. And I'm going to tell it to st stop when our count reaches a certain point. So I'm going to say M count is greater than three okay you can kind of see the question mark on there is indicating oops um, the question mark on there indicates that there is a condition on it Let's see so as long as it's if it's three greater than three then we will break but otherwise we won't break so I'm going to go back to the app. Watch. So I'm in the count method. See, it hasn't. I hit count, didn't break. Hit count, didn't break. So now it breaks when the count has reached four. Um, so sometimes you want to set that up to not hit the condition all the time because maybe there's some initial setup that you need to do. If that makes sense, you just want to hit it at a certain point um, in the process. So from there, because I've said greater than three, it stopped at this point. Let's say I want to run and get back into it, hit count, and from here it'll stop every time. Does that make sense? So that way I can rush up to the point where I really care about and not deal with the breakpoints up until that point. Um, you can always remove a breakpoint, as you see there, just by unclicking it. Um, another way to work with breakpoints, you'll see there's a little, the two breakpoint symbols here on the left. If I click that, that'll bring up a, a list. I actually put some more breakpoints in here. So I have one in toast and one in count. So you can see the two breakpoints that I have. You can see one is on line 34, one is on line 40. I can set conditions in here as well. That's the other way you can set the conditions. But what's really interesting in here is notice that second group of checkboxes. Do you see that? Notice that second group of checkboxes? So Java exception breakpoints, exception breakpoints. If I check those, then it will actually break any time an exception is thrown. Regardless of try catch. Regardless of try catch. Which can be really helpful, right? So it can be helpful to catch things that happen even if you don't have a try catch on it. Right? So maybe you forgot to check for something and something happened. That gives you a quick way to, okay, okay the, the debugger will pause right at that point and you can see the values of the variable and figure out what went wrong. And so that can be really helpful. Um, it also means that if you've done what I mentioned earlier and swallowed exceptions, right? You put a try catch around it, but you just didn't do anything with the exception. You, you swallowed it, right? Well, that will still 
trigger. So you can find those things that maybe you forgot that you swallowed an exception somewhere through. Does that make sense? How do you do that? So it's over here on the left. You see the two breakpoint images? So you just open that up, check those two boxes. Now if there's any exception thrown, we'll stop at that breakpoint. And that helps also just not having to put breakpoints everywhere for things like that. Um, and I also in here, I can enable or disable breakpoints. And you kind of can see if I disable, it goes to an empty circle. That means it's not, it's there, but it's not active. Um, that can be useful as you're kind of working through things, especially as in the real world, you may end up with five to 10 breakpoints when you really kind of like it's here, it's here, it's here. Um, but that way you can still keep your breakpoints as a way to kind of get back to them without removing them. Does that make sense? Okay. So that can be helpful. Um, the other thing I can do, let me re-enable those two. Um, the other thing I can do is I can click this little button here to mute the breakpoints. And what that does is as long as that's checked, none of the breakpoints get triggered. Because sometimes, again, you kind of need to get to a certain state before you can actually test it. So you can mute the breakpoints until you get it into the state where you need to test it, unmute it, and, and have your breakpoints actually activated at that point. So that can be very helpful, especially as you have a lot. If you have 10 plus breakpoints in your code, that can be really helpful so you can get into the actual case that you're looking for. Um, so on the left, we've kind of seen these already. If you're on a breakpoint, you can hit the resume button to get back and running. Um, at any time, you can hit the stop button. The stop actually is going to completely shut down your application. Um, so it is helpful in some cases, but it's probably not the button you want to hit most of the time. Um, there's also a button in here to pause the application. So that's if you're not on a breakpoint, you can hit pause, and then I can get in here and see what's what's actually going on. Now, the problem with pause is it jumps in wherever the application is, right? So where is where is the the main thread right now? Well, it's not in my code, right? It's running this native pull once method. Um, and it might be running something else if I pause it again, which it isn't, right? So in that, oftentimes, while the pause can be helpful, um, it's usually not all, not usually all that helpful unless you have something long running, right? So if I have long something long running in the background, um, then pause can be helpful to kind of see, okay, what's holding it up? Um, if there's something that's causing the application to freeze, that can be helpful there, um, but if you have just short running code, it's usually better to just have a breakpoint and trigger that breakpoint. Okay, so we want conditional stops, watches. Okay, let's talk about that. So let me get the bugger running again. Um, okay. All right, the application's already running. Okay, so I want to hit toast. Right, so I'm into the toast. We can see the count is zero. I'm going to go in here. Oh, I actually need to not do this on the watch. I need to do this on the actual variable. So under this, I'm going to right click M count. And you'll see that there's this option called set value. So if I'm going, to ch I'm going to go in here and I'm going to change the value to 10. Hit enter. 
Now on the actual device, M count is 10. Nothing's updated on the UI. We're still paused. Let me go ahead and hit resume. Okay. So it's still showing zero because I didn't change the I didn't change the text. We hit count. Hey, what's M count now? It's eleven. Cool. So I can go in there and manually change values. Right, so I may want to do that for, for a variety of reasons, whether that means just getting to my test condition that I want to check, or whether that means getting into cases that technically aren't valid in the current state of things or are hard to reproduce. Right, So sometimes you may have a user in a state that, okay, I theoretically know it could, the variables could get into that state, but I don't know how to get the variables into that state through just using the UI. Um, so sometimes it can be helpful to manipulate the variables that way so that you can test. Does that make sense? Or so you can test cases that you might not have you might not have thought of just using the UI. Okay. Um, so as we're stepping through code, um, let's say you have a, ver a fairly long method that we want to step through, especially if we have some sort of loops. Um, there's a bunch of different buttons that we can use as we're stepping through the code, once we've gotten all those right points. Uh, the first one is step over. Step over says, take the current line, skip any method calls, any logic that you've got on that line, and go to the next method, next to the next line. Does that make sense? I don't want to pause, I don't want to look at anything that's happening on this line, just go to the next one. Most of the time, that's the button you want to hit. Most of the time, F8 is the one you want to just step over to the next line until you find out which line is interesting. Okay. Once you find out what line is interesting, I mean, this you may not be able to figure out until the second time it runs through. You might have to run it once, you know, step over, to kind of figure out where the problem is, and then come back and you step into. Step into, we'll step into the method calls on a particular line, right? So you have, hey, this method does blah, blah, blah. I may need to step into that method and see what the methods do, right? So that will let me step into the method. Um, there's also another option here for force step into. So step into will work as long as you're in your own code. Um, but typically it will skip, it may skip over. Um, some common JDK apps under the assumption that maybe you, you probably don't want to look at that. So, but if you really do want to jump into the JDK classes, you can do four step into, which is just shift F7 instead of F8. Um, there's also step out. So, say you're pretty deep in the call stack and you want to get back to the previous method that called it, well, then you can hit step out and that will get you back up a layer in your step frame. Okay. You can also select a line of code and say run to cursor. And that will what that will do is it will run all the all the code necessary up until where your cursor is, up until that line that your cursor is on. Um, they show a picture for the toolbar there, but let me actually show it here um, because the icons have changed. So I'm going to go back into the emulator, get myself paused. Okay, so looking up at the top, you'll see first here's the step over button, right? So step over a line. We've got step into that, that method call that's on the current line. We've got step four step into, and there's the step out, right? So if I'm on this line here, what button do I need to hit to get to the next line? I need to hit, if I want to go down here, what button do I need to hit? Step over, step over right? If I want to go into the call for make text, what button do I need to hit? Step into, right? 
Now, what if I want to get to the call? Um, and let me actually change this. Let me stop it and change this a little bit. What if I kind of do this all on one line? And I say, make text and then show, right? Let's say I've got my code that way. All right, well, step into will get me into make text. Step over will get me down here. But what do I need to do to get into step into show? Run the cursor. Remember, run the cursor will run all the lines up until that line, right? It doesn't run within the line. So I'm going to hit toast here. So we're on the line, right? Let's hit step over real quick. Okay, I'm down here, so that's not going to work. That skips past the part I'm interested in. Let's try step into. Okay, so I'm going to step into make text. Right? So I'm in make text. Well, what can we see about make text? What does make text do? Calls another method called make text. Um, but also notice in here, you see there's another method called context, get resources, get text. So there's three method calls, make text, get resources, get text. Which of those three method calls is going to happen first? Get resources, right? Get resources, this has to happen before I can call make text, right? So if I call step into, what line of code am I going into? I'm going into get resources, okay? So let's go deeper down this route call. All right, so I'm in get resources. That's great. <laughs> There's some stuff going on. All right, I'm going to step over until I get out of this method. Okay, so I'm back here now, right? So if I step hit step into again, right? I just finished get resources. Step into is now going to actually take me to the next method, right? So we've gone into get resources. Show of hands, who thinks we're going to go into make text? Who thinks we're going to go into get text? Okay, so votes for make text. Votes for get text. Okay. Let's see where we actually go. So I'm going to go into, I'm going to step into this time, and we're in get text. Right? If I were to step in on this line, I would be going into get assets. Right? And then I come back here and I go get resource text. So you can get very deep because of all these method calls, okay? Well, let's get out of here. So I'm gonna hit step out, okay? So we've gone through get resources, we've gone through get text. Let's try one more step into. Oh, cool, I'm into the other version of make text, which calls another version of make text, which if we look here, you can kind of see that. Here's one version of make text that calls another version of make text. Step into that again. So now you can see make text calls make text calls make text make text calls make text calls make text. Yeah, um, I, I call that Java programmers actually <laughs> um, who like their overloads. Um, this is this is one of those reasons why I say you know there's there's a lot of reasons why you really don't want a lot of overload. This this is one of those things where. It becomes confusing as you see what's actually going on. Because now we're a few levels deep. Okay, so we're all in this make text depth. We can go go around there all we want, but let's let's come back to main activity. Let's get out of here. Okay, so now I'm back to make text. Right, I'm sorry, I'm back to show text. So remember, what did I do to get in there? Step into. I went step into initially. Right, so step into took me into make text. Now that I've come back up here, the next thing that the code needs to do is call show. So now I can actually step into show. 
So does that make sense? If you have a lot of stuff happening on one line, you may have to use step into, step out to actually get to that particular function call that you're interested in. Um, and sometimes what that means, um, if you want to make your code a lot easier to, to debug, do less on one line. Um, I can call method call, method call, method call, and chain a bunch of method calls together. And there's some value to that. Um, but just note that it's really hard to debug because of that, that kind of thing. Um, and that's, that's true whatever language you're working with. Um, every debugger is based on law. Every, every language is that way. So um, doing a bunch of function calls on one line is not usually a good idea. You can, um, but recognize that that's going to be a pain at some point when you have to debug it. Okay, so we're in Toast, we're in Show. I'm going to step out to get out of here. And then I could step out if I wanted to to get out of Show Toast, but that doesn't really take us anywhere interesting. Okay. Does that help to kind of see what those buttons are? Again, the most common one that I would recommend you use is that step over because most of the time that's going to be the easiest way to find out where your problem is. Um, if you do have a case where you have a method calling another method and you think the problem is probably in that other method, well, that's where you'll need to step into. Um, but most of the time, your bug will be in the method that you're looking at. So we went over resume and pause, mute all breakpoints. Yep. So that's really that's really it. Um, so there's there's some articles that you can kind of read up to find out more. There's a whole article about debugging apps. There's a whole article about or there's a video about testing and how you can use that. Any questions? So your Code lab for this is going to ask you to go to an app called Simple Calculator and debug it. Um, I've uploaded that to Inside Rankin. I've actually converted it over to the straight layout. It was a mix of linear layout and relative and such, so you can kind of see how we would set that up. Well, some minor fixes. Um, so you can download that from Inside Rankin. Um, the code lab, the code challenge for that let me open that up get out of here exit so the code lab the, the coding challenge on here is maybe a little bit nondescript on what it wants you to do um, so it says at the end of task one, you try to do yada yada with no values in the fields. And it's asking you to fix that bug. Um, so let me run through just so you can see what, what's going on there first. I'm going to run the app. Just so you know what I'm, I'm kind of looking for. Okay, so here is the simple calculator app, right? So, so task one, as part of task one, what they're going to ask you to go ahead and do is click one of these buttons. Just leave the fields blank. Let's click add, right? So what this was supposed to do was add offering one and offering two, right? Whatever number I typed in the first field, whatever I, whatever I typed in the second field, let's add that and display down here, right? But it just says the word 
payroll. Right? So from the user perspective, that doesn't really, it's not really a good message, right? So one of the things that I would expect, and the biggest thing I would expect as you're quote unquote fixing this, which is the, the whole coding challenge for today, um, is definitely show an error message that tells me what actually went wrong. Right? If I were a user, right, if you were a user, a user of this application, what information do you need to see to know, hey, what went wrong? Why did I get an error? Right? Because this doesn't tell me a lot. It doesn't tell me what I need to fix. It just tells me something went wrong. So all we're doing is changing that error. Basically, that's what I want to see. Um, now, I, I am going to probably ask you to explain to me what the actual cause of the error is, right? And I am going to ex expect that because you're, you're supposed to kind of go through the debugging tools. So I'm going to expect you to tell me what line of code is it and, and how we can fix that, if that makes sense. Right. So so that's that's where I'm going to be expecting from the coding challenge is to change that message, the fix that I'm looking for, is to change that message so that it gives something descriptive to each. Um, now, what's another way that you could solve that problem? What's another way we could solve this error? Um, if there's no input, default is to zero. Okay, so I can assume zero. So zero plus zero is zero. zero. Right, so that would be another way to deal with it, is assume that the value that is one is zero. Is this a built-in um or what, what's going on right now if you type in letters and numbers, or letters rather than numbers? So let me just do first one that actually works. So add. Not even lag me. So there's a setting. There's something. So there's something that's not letting me type in letters. Um, you can take your first break um, at this point and come back at 2 o'clock.